Okay, uh, again, my name is Doug Tieft. Most of you probably haven't met me. Hopefully you haven't met me because usually when I show up, it's bad news for everybody. Something uh, we're called to go in. Uh, I've been around, I grew up with uh, uh, dogs. Uh, it was RCMP kennels I grew up at. So I was always used to 20, 30 dogs around me. My first words were kind of liquor bite as I shoved my hands in the pen. So over the years, I've, I've worked a lot of dogs with different, uh, in different elements, detection work, search work, uh, patrol work. Uh, I've done a lot of work with the local bylaw services. I train them in the beginning. Uh, I give ongoing training to them so that they're up to speed as to what uh, to do in different situations. I'm not here to be your friend today. I'm here to help you get home tonight, tomorrow night and the next night. When you are off work, whether you believe it or not, they do miss you at work, all right? The, it's, it's not just that you get injured, you're sitting there, you have your husbands, wives, kids. It takes a lot of quality of life away from you. So when we do these presentations, what I'm trying to do is prepare you for the unexpected. What to do should you go into a situation that uh, suddenly you're encountering a dog. This is a general presentation uh, it's, it wasn't ne meant necessarily just for your organization. It was just to show you some different examples of how to get in and out of, out of uh, a problem area. What happens if the dog does come towards me? What happens if it does bite me? How do I get out with the least number of injuries? When I put this together, <clears throat> it was interesting. I started looking at some of the, uh, the uh, pre uh, specs on dog bites. And it was interesting what we saw. Uh, when I give this same presentation to bylaw officers, I don't spare anything. I'm going to show you some stuff today that you may not want to see, but it's reality. It's what happens. Uh, if you don't watch out for yourself, how are you ever going to watch out for somebody else? So also what we're trying to do here is to help you be aware of what could happen to someone else as well. So you're their backup. You're their safety. So with that, of course, outline today is the stats. I'll go over some stats as to what are the number of dog bites around? What are they based on? It's beware of your environment. Uh, why do dogs bite? The different types of signs of behaviors in dogs and approaching a yard. Second part is he's attacking. Now what? Survival situation. It's gone to the point where the dog is attacking you and now you're just trying to survive to get out of that situation. We'll go over a review. And there'll be a video presentation where we'll show you some actual situations and how to get in and out of the uh, situation successfully without the, uh, with the least number of injuries. There'll be questions at that time, and we won't be doing demos today right here, but you can uh, follow that up with your own uh, area where you're working. There, in HRM last year, there were a total of 558 calls. 392 of the 558 animals were dogs. Yes, we do respond to other animals, and so do you guys. In 2015, we investigated 91 biting complaints. 49 were to humans, 42 were to animals. In, 2000, uh, in 2016, we investigated 89 biting complaints. 45 were to humans, 44 were to animals. In Canada, it says 42 Canadians are bit every hour. And you have to remember, not all these stats are turned in, so we don't know exactly how many there are. Those are just the ones that have gone to, say, emergency wards and been re uh, reported. Canada Post reported 800 dogs uh, in bite incidents since 2007. They go to homes every day. Sometimes they swap up areas, there's a substitute. They don't know what to expect when they go to a yard. So we'll go over this in this uh, video here as to how to approach that yard and know that, okay, I'm going to be aware of what's around me. Between 1990 and 2000, there were 28 fatal dog bites in Canada. 50% of the bites occur on the owner's own property. How does that apply to you? You may have to go, as your organization, you may have to go to someone's yard. You may have to go and pick up animals in a different environment. So you're in an area where you're hopping out where that area is familiar to the dog, but it's new to you. So some general information on it 
is any dog can be turned into a dangerous dog. The owner is most often responsible for making a dog into something dangerous. Most dogs don't, they aren't born with this preconceived idea, I have to bite everybody, I have to be mean. One of, there's only two reasons normally why a dog gets into an aggressive state. Number one is it was environmentally induced or is hereditary. Hereditary uh, is usually a small portion of why they are aggressive. Environmentally induced, how many times you see them out playing? Sick them, go ahead, bite them, bite them. They get the dogs to do things in a play sense that in reality, when a situation happens, they go back to what, oh yeah, I did that when I was playing. I'm gonna follow through and not let this person in the yard, not let this person out of the compound area, not let this person into the pen that you're going into with the dog. Any individual dog may be a good dog, even though its breed is considered to be a potentially dangerous breed. One can look, uh, one cannot look at an individual dog and recognize its breed and then state it's a dangerous dog. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there about dogs. It's a pit bull, it's gotta be bit. It's just a dog. Okay, that actually there's no such thing as a true pit bull today as it was originally uh, started off as. Variations and crossbreeding and backyards now have developed a dog that's all over the place. Uh, pit bulls, when they were originally bred, they were bred not to touch humans because they would have to go into a pen or an arena to take them back out again. So they were never to touch humans. Somewhere along the line, we've crossed the line and we start mixing up the breeding and we have a dog that doesn't know if it's coming or going. So what happens is it totally depends on its own environment that you bring it up in or the owner brings it up in. In more than two thirds of the cases, the life threatening or fatal attacks were apparently the first known dangerous behavior of that dog. How many times have you heard, but my dog's never bit anybody before? Well, guess what? There's the first time. Okay, you don't, you don't want to be the first time. It's important that you realize just because the dog has no history, it doesn't mean it's not gonna bite. Some general information. Fear can be a helpful emotion. There's nothing wrong with with being fearful of a situation. It means you, you respect and acknowledge the possible consequences of the situation. In other words, you know, oh, this is what could potentially happen to me today. Okay, I could get bit. All right, overconfidence can lead to mistakes and injury. Someone goes in, oh, it's okay, dogs won't hurt me. And you walk in, what happens is you drop all your guards Okay, always be aware, any dog can bite. If you ask me with my dog if it bites, I can tell you, no, it's never bitten anybody yet. I can't say what it's gonna to do tomorrow. You have to remember something. In a situation like your own, what happens is you get a dog brought into you for various different reasons. You don't know the background, you don't know the history. You don't know that one little thing that might be the trigger that causes that dog to react. Maybe it had a really bad reaction to a certain person, a certain male, a certain female, someone that wore a particular type of clothing. You don't know until suddenly it's triggered someday. You may get the trigger, you may not get the trigger, but always be aware that there could be one in there. The gentle pat to the head in a certain way could be that one thing that sends the dog off. You don't know. Okay, a combination of fear and respect and knowledge can get you out of a situation with limited injury. Now what do I mean by limited injury? A lot of times you don't know that you've triggered a dog until after it's already triggered and it's reacting to you. Okay, so if it's already bit you, I can't tell you how to prevent that from happening for the first initial time. So what happens is, bang, the dog's on me, now what? The main thing that you have to remember is prepare yourself before you go in. Okay, why do dogs bite? Very easy. There are four main reasons why dog attacks or, or bites a human. <clears throat> Protecting its own property. Most dogs will instinctively protect their own property. It's theirs. Okay, it's theirs. They want to scare away the bad people. Take, for instance, letter carriers. They go up to a house. The dog sees them coming up. They're wearing a uniform. Okay, what's the dog see? Oh, stranger coming in. What's they? What? They'll go put a letter or something, they'll rattle the mailbox. 
potential intruder. The dog barks. What happens? The person turns and walks away. It didn't walk away because the dog scared it. It walked away because it finished doing its job, put the mail in, and walks away. So the dog says, I scared that person. So now anybody with that type of a uh, uniform, hey, I can scare those people by simply going up and barking at them. It could be a, something as simple as a certain type of hat you wear. It could be the uniform itself, anything. They have that ingrained in here that, hey, every time I bark at this person, they go away. Okay, so protecting themselves. Okay, why would they do that? It could be because they've had a history, a bad history of possibly being hit, injured, beat, you don't know. One experience with a dog can leave a lifetime of memories. One bad experience is all it takes, and that one dog will remember it, and it will be re-triggered. So suddenly you see them being very shy of you, you don't know what it is that they're actually trying to remember. Prey behaviors and herding. When these, these dogs, uh, border collies, different Aussies, things like that, uh, they have a herding drive. Dogs with prey drive, they love things that run. They love things that move. When you turn and run, guess what? Oh, game on. Prey drive. Herding means they want to keep you in one area. That herding can take place in their yard. It can take place anywhere. It's instinctively bred into the dog. They have herding instincts. So if you have, what happens when you have a couple of dogs that get together? Sometimes in your situations here, you're putting dogs out where there's a two, maybe two, three dogs together. Sure, there may be people out there, but there are two and three dogs. They're looking at the other dogs in some cases and saying, hey, you guys go in the person mode. Dogs train to attack. Don't confuse a properly trained dog and a police dog. Out of all the bite stats, uh, actually for the last three years, how many bites do you think were from trained patrol dogs? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. So the dogs you're scared of the most have the smallest number. So really, if you train a dog to attack, that's one thing. But to do all its training, a patrol dog, police dog, has to finish its training. In other words, they can call them off. There's a time to do it and time not to do it. That is different from the dog that's into your facility, the dog that you run into maybe out on the street. Friendly dog behavior. Okay, most barking dogs are trying to communicate with you. A barking dog that is relaxed and moving the whole body is generally a friendly dog. They're very relaxed, kind of a, hi, how are you doing? Very, very relaxed in their motions, no tension at all. Uh, the head of these dogs would be held up high or hung very low. Hi, how are you doing? Is it, you know, big goof, marmaduke. Okay, as they're swinging the whole body from side to side. This is where it's going to make a difference in you reading your dogs. Okay, these dogs usually approach at a loping gait. Just a nice steady pace, relax as they're coming up here. The mouth is partly open and the back corners of the mouth is, are extended back. What I mean by that is when you see the muzzle of the dog, this back corner is extended back all the way. It's like in a big grin when they're smiling. The more serious they get, you'll see this corner moving further and further forward. Here's a uh, good example here, a relaxed dog. Ears are up, natural position, not going forward. What happens is the dogs are neutral, ears are neutral territory. That's for the dogs that do have erect ears. Tail is hung at a natural position, okay? Loose stance, and they're down flat on their feet. The mouth is partly open, and you'll see there by the tongue, that section actually goes back, just in the back of the mouth. Here's another one. The head erect, ears are up, mouth relaxed, slightly open. You'll see it slightly open. You'll see the panting a little bit, okay? Weight is evenly distributed on all four feet. That's another thing that's very important. The tail is relaxed and, and wagging. So, the alert dog. The alert dog, ears are forward. They may twitch, try, trying to uh, catch some sound. Okay? The mouth is closed. As soon as uh, some, the dog's mouth is closed and starts paying attention to you. 
the body has a slight forward lean to it. It's leaning in like this, trying to go ahead to get everything it can from you, pick up every kind of signal that's out there. The dog is standing tall, but it's on its toes. The tail, it's horizontal, but not stiff. Maybe moving slightly from back and forth. There's a big difference between a slow move back and forth and a twitch. You'll see in this dog here, the ears are starting to go forward. The tail starts to come up. It's really hard on a dog that hasn't got any tail. Okay, so you had to skip it on those type breeds. The tail may be moving slowly at a steady pace, side to side, not fast twitch. The eyes are open, the mouth is closed, slightly forward. You'll see the front and the hind feet, they come up onto the toes a little bit. They start to tense up, they start to get tight. Here's another one. Okay, you can call it arousal. In other words, hey, they're just wondering what's going on. Can I get a feel of, of who this person is, what the situation is? The muzzle's tense, uh, the lip lifted to display the teeth. That's the next step a little bit as they start to, all right, I'm going to show you my teeth a little bit, but it's a natural reaction in the dog when they do that. It's not something that they're trying to scare you away right away. The eyes are large, uh, hard staring. They stay fixated. All right. Uh, the tail is starting to go up and it's getting stiffer. Now you might start to see that little twitch happening. The legs are stiff, weight over the front legs. It will lean in, the whole body will lean in on it. A stressed or anxious dog behavior lowers the body. The ears are pinned back, usually. Uh, the pupils are dilated. If you're that close that you can see the pupils, first of all, you're probably too close to the front of the dog to see uh, what's going on. At this point, there's no white around the eyes yet. It's just they're starting to dilate. Rapid panning, uh, and the corner of the mouth starts to move forward. The tail is tucked down tight under the body. So you have a situation like this one right here. Lowered body, tail down. We've all seen this on the dogs. They're a little timid and they're coming up to you. Hi, hi, can you be my friend? Please don't hurt me. This dog is starting to get a little stressed. Again, the rapid panting uh, the, with the corner of the mouth, it will start coming forward. If you could see what was on the floor or the ground of the dog, you'd actually see they're starting to sweat through the paws, the bottom of the paws. Remember, dogs don't sweat. They only put out moisture where? The paws in their mouth. Panting and have to do the paws. Submissive nature. With a dog like this, the dog's eyes are kind of half closed. They'll start blinking. The mouth is nearly closed altogether. The tongue, they're just the tip. You see it start to stick out a little bit. You know, they're sticking the tongue out saying, Hi, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm friendly. I'm friendly. Really, I am. What are you going to do? These dogs are nervous. All right, they're very nervous. They don't know what's going on. The raised paw, everybody thinks that's cute. Oh, look, it's giving me the one paw salute. No, it means the dog is anxious. It's worried about something. It can't figure it out. It means they're in a state of confusion when they do that. So when they, they do that and they're left in the paw, it's almost a signal saying, um, can you help me? Can you give me a clear signal as to, are you my friend? Are you here to help me? Or are you here to hurt me? Tail hangs low again, that's pretty well standard. Aggressive dogs, let's go into that a little bit. Most dogs are territorial. They're protecting their property, both them and their owner. If there's a dog in a yard and you go up to a yard with the dog and its owner or master there, you'll see dog acting in a certain way. Once that person goes in the house, that dog will change. It's now on its own, it's trying to protect something. How can that relate to you guys? the pen they're putting in. As soon as they're put in that pen, after a very short period, that's their little home. And sometimes they may not want you in there that day. Okay, it could be around the food. Um, the body will appear tense on these guys here. The tail is stiff and it's twitching. Head will be in what's called a neutral level. Okay, it's not hung down, it's not up. It's just about level when you see it across the body. Uh, they'll run at a steady run. It's almost mechanical. They're, they're very stiff as they're running. They aren't relaxed, you'll see a huge difference. And I'll show you in a video when it's coming up here on that. Eyes may look like they're glazed over or fixed on you. Okay, that is something that, you know, this is a lot to start to take in. How do I remember all this stuff? <coughs> okay, an aggressive dog, there's uh, some of the behaviors they have. There's growling, snarling, curling the lip up a little bit. The nose will actually curl up. You see if a dog goes like starts, the lip will curl. 
you'll see the wrinkles on the nose. You start to see the wrinkles on the nose if its teeth are starting to show and starting to growl. When you see the wrinkles, the dog is in a serious state. Back away, okay? Be aware that this dog is now, not only went through the confused stage, but now it's prepared to do something if it has to. Uh, it will come at you in very short lunging actions. It'll, woof, woof, it'll go back and it's just trying to scare you away. I'll take one step but it will back off a little bit at the same time. It's trying to give you a signal to back away. I don't know what's going on. Please stay uh, clear. As far as territorial goes, what it'll do is it'll block you from coming into that area. It could be the yard, it could be whatever it is that they've deemed their own. Redirected aggression. Okay, redirected aggression is, is I'm really ticked at you, and I'm mad, and I pick this up and I start shaking the daylights out of it because it's taken out its frustration. Redirected aggression. It's trying to take it out here. That dog is actually a little safer than the one that doesn't do this and wants to come in and shake you instead. All right, so be careful. A redirected aggression means the dog's trying to get it out of a system. And if you don't allow it, you could end up in serious trouble. Fearful dogs. Uh, dogs can fear out of being hurt, okay? Uh, what is their history? In a case like you guys there, you don't know where the dogs came from. You don't know their history. You don't know if all of a sudden you take a shovel out to clean. Well, that's what they were beat with. And all of a sudden you see them come right back. Oh, that shovel reminds me of, could be a bad situation. They'll not look at you directly in the eye. They'll try just off to the side, look at you just off the corner of their eyes. The head will be, tried, uh, be turned away. Uh, the hackles will be up on the back. I call it uh, puffer fish syndrome. What happens with a fearful dog, it wants it to make itself look as big as possible to scare the other person away. Everybody's seen the dogs at the hackles. They're trying to put themselves off as, hey, look at me. I'm big. Uh, they're trying not to get cornered in open areas. In other words, if you have your compound and there's a dog that might be loose in the compound, yeah, you want to corner it because I'm trying to catch it to go in. It's playing catch me if you can. But if suddenly that dog thinks that, whoops, uh, I can't get out of here, we'll go back to the fight or flight rule. Well, uh, I can't get out of here, so I'm going to do something to get myself through. And you'll see a sudden switch in behavior. Uh, the fight or flight rule, again, you see these dogs that are on leash and another dog loose coming up. It comes running over and the guy says, it's okay, my dog's friendly. And your dog's on a lead beside you. And suddenly your dog launches off of that other dog. What dog was at fault? It wasn't the dog on the lead. The dog had no choice. It had to stay here. It knew it was on a leash. And it didn't like the idea of this other dog running up to it. Okay, so in a situation like your own, make sure each dog has their own area. This is something that I kind of do. Uh, dogs have their own safety zone. You know, they're, they're kind of, they're uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable? <laughs> you really uncomfortable now? A little bit? Okay. I just went through into her private area. All these dogs have a line in the sand. It's something as simple as that. I got too close, you weren't comfortable. That's normal. That's, we all have that. So what happens is these dogs have the same thing. Whoa. Especially you have a new dog coming into your area. Oh, don't laugh. I could be up with you next here. <laughs> so it, it's... It's, uh, it's true. These dogs have their own area. Okay, I always give a dog its own territory. It knows it's safe within that line and respect it. So when you have dogs that are on lead, remember that when you bring them up to another dog, there's a lot of things you have to start thinking about. Are we forcing them on each other? A fearful dog, body lowered again, hackles, both, both front and back. It, usually the first stage is just the front hackles coming up. The second would be the back. You see the ridge running right down the back. And tail tucked in, we've all seen this. The, the eyes are dilated, but the ears are pinned back. The things you're gonna look for. See that uh, right there the, on the nose, it says nose wrinkled. Fear and aggression, it's a fine line. 
when you're told the dog does this out of fear and the dog does this out of being aggressive, it's not black and white. It's not that easy. Sometimes the fear aggression is worse than the dog that's really bold because there's a difference in how they will act in the sense that you can go, you're going to get bit by either one. A dog that's that scared will do whatever it has to get out. Same thing here, lips are curled, foot's full aggression. You can see the nose, uh, it's curled up. The teeth are totally bared at this point. Uh, they start changing their weight forward, okay, and then they start coming in. The dog, the tail will actually get stiff and it'll start twitching. Approaching a yard. This could be a yard outside, it could be a yard in your compound. If you're a volunteer in some of these, you know, different places around the province, you have a dog out in the backyard. You haven't seen the dog before, you don't know it. You're going in to do your work. All right, so there's two situations you have to be aware of. One where it's a semi-controlled situation, and that's in the case that you're going out in a compound. The other is, is what happens if you have to go pick up a dog somewhere? What ha happens if you approach some area? Things to look out for, tie outs, dog bones, toys, uh, dog defecation, okay, uh, dog shelter, house, pens, could be just a blanket thrown somewhere. Uh, look for kids' toys that are chewed up. Doesn't have to be dog toys. Could be kids' toys chewed up. Water bowl, feed bowl. Look for worn patterns around, for instance, if they have a fenced area, around the inside they'll have a run pattern. They'll be all worn down. Could be around a tree. They may have taken the tie in that, in that day and you didn't know that they had a dog. So all these things would be pretty evident because they hook it up to the fence or the <clears throat> front door sometimes in the VO travel area there. You're approaching the yard. The person is there with the dog. Insist they put the dog away. Uh, yes, ma'am, uh, just wonder if you could put your dog away for a minute. I just have, uh, I wanted to talk to something, about something with you. No, no, my dog's okay. No, let them put the dog away so you can have your discussion with them. Never pet a dog in an outside area that you aren't familiar with. The dog has no loyalty to you. You're a stranger. I have seen too many times, oh, it's okay, dogs like me. That's really nice, that might be your opinion. Dog doesn't know you. So to them, you're just as bad as the bad person out there until they get to the point where they know what your intentions are. But the first ones are, back away. Dog may uh, be considered, it can be considered provoking the dog if you go in towards that dog as if I cross that line, okay? You come in, first of all, you come into their territory. That's the first line they draw. Second line is their own personal one. And it could be as close as a couple feet or it could be as far away as that wall or some fenced area. If the owner answers the door with the dog and it becomes aggressive, secure the door with your hand and or foot. <clears throat> Summertime's coming here. You've got those nice storm doors on the outside and they have the little door handle that you push and it opens it up. Some of them have a full bar. When the dog jumps up at it, the the door's gonna open. Be aware of that. I put my hand on the door, and my other foot is down near the bottom of the door, so it can't push it back out again. That's the first thing you're gonna do, is prepare for the unexpected. Make sure that they can't get out. You can hold it that, uh, at that distance, as far as closed, while you're still talking to them. Ask them to put the dog away. <clears throat> if you're caught in the house with the dog, back to the wall, and back yourself outside, just outside the door, and secure the door. If you're in that house, that it's, is the master's domain. Now the dog gets very protective and doesn't want you to do anything, especially if the person's voice escalates. If you have someone coming into your compounds, coming into your facility, and <clears throat> you have their dog, it happens. It was running at large, it was picked up, you took it in or someone took it in there to your facility, you have the dog, and now you have an irate owner coming in. The owner has already escalated up to a certain level. You've got all, everything you can do to deal with this person to try to calm them down. Don't bring their dog out. All right, leave the dog away until things have de-escalated. You bring the dog out, the dog picks up on its owner's anxiety and what's going on, and the dog could become protective of its very owner, even though it's been with you for the past little while. All right, so be aware of that. They, their loyalty is to their master. And the thing is about dogs, it's kind of funny. You can beat them, you can be mean to them, they still go back. They still go back to their owner, but that's my owner, it's okay. It'll be all right today. They still have that devotion that you have to remember, don't let the two of them become involved with each other 
while you're there dealing with the situation. In a case like that, you have someone dealing with this, the dog or the dog owner, keep the other dog back. Approaching the dog, stay calm. Assume a non-threatening position, facing them straight on or appearing to be staring at them is a threat. Okay, so if I go up and I'm staring at you, okay, it's going to be, hey, guess what? That's what I do when I'm a dog, when I'm trying to challenge you. I'm going to stare you down. So are you trying to stare them down? What are you trying to do? Okay, so you look your head, your head is off a little bit to the angle on the side, but keep them in plain view right here. So you can do that, but just off the side and keeping an eye on the dog right here. Don't maintain a head-on stare with the dog. Remove your sunglasses if possible. These glasses, they automatically change when I'm outside. It's a disadvantage for me. Dogs read other dogs by visual cues. They look for eye language. They can't read your eyes because you have sunglasses on. There are great big things that are staring at them. That's all they see. <clears throat> if you have a hat, take it off. A lot of times something as simple as a hat can trigger the dog, especially if you have a, a, a bigger hat, big floppy hat. Okay, that will actually, they don't know what's going on. It's strange to them. It's a new item that they don't know how to deal with. Do not endanger the dog. Do not leave the dog feeling it is cornered. Again, it goes back to that, oh, you walk up on the step and this is the deck or the front uh, steps and now the dog is stuck in there. You aren't going to go into that area, trust me. You're going to back out, let that dog come out. It has no escape. In your compound, you have a dog now that suddenly has turned. Could be a chemical imbalance. Those are the things that you can run into on dogs that you don't know about. Was it behavior? Was it a chemical imbalance? Okay, suddenly, bang, the dog snaps. What do you do then? Okay, so in that situation, don't corner the dog. Okay, the tail wagon. It could be happy or excited to bite you. Oh great, another victim, let's go. Because I chased the other one away and I bit them on the way out. Because I chased them off my property. So they could be excited because they know they had a job to do before, they did it. I know this one and they're happy to go do the do job. So it could be to chase you out of there. Um, <clears throat> okay, don't look away from the dog. That's a sign of you being weak. So it's just off to one side again, like I said, just off, but keep them in your view. If you look away, you can't see what the dog's doing. You have to maintain the view of the dog at all times. Uh, sniff the hand. The dog's up to you and it's sniffing your hand. What do you do then? Go back to some of the signs we just went over. Okay, go back and have a look. What's the dog doing? Is the uh, hair on its back standing up? Is it, you know, what's it doing? Okay, and just look at the dog, depending on what you're seeing for uh, your signals before the dog came up. Dogs don't smell fear. They smell weakness, disease, wounds, death, infections. All kinds of things, okay, that they sense as, okay, I can be dominant over that situation. A dog, uh, uh, when the dogs go up and check each other out, I call them checking the license plates, all right, they say all kinds of things to each other. When they go for a walk and smell, this dog urinated over here, they can tell tons of things through that. They can tell if the dog is, uh, has a disease. They can tell if the dog, everything about the dog. It's like a computer printout on every post to them. It's that easy to see for them. I'm glad we can't do it. Believe me, I wouldn't be sniffing posts, but the, uh, be careful when you're going with the dogs. They see fear, Every, uh, scared stiff. Everybody's heard the phrase scared stiff. Paralyzed and fear is the same thing. All of a sudden you froze. You don't know what to do, they sense that. Because when you freeze, you get tense. When you get tense, you change the biological output from your body. You have a chemical change in your body that they can uh, sense. I had one dog, a patrol dog, I sit down beside you and ask you questions. I just had to look at my dog and should tell me if you're lying or not. Okay, because you can't, you can't deliberately tell a lie without thinking about some process ahead of time. If I tell you, look at that board right there, it's white, and, but tell me it's some other color, the first thing that goes through your mind is it's white. So you have a process that starts going on inside you. Uh, sue them. Try to talk in a calm voice. Don't raise your voice up. Just a normal voice, no commanding voice. So, hi, pup. What you doing? All right, good pup. Uh, don't wave your arms around. That's a threat. That's an action that they don't know what you're going to do next. Okay, so you're moving things around. 
don't wave it in front of the dog. It may be taken as the aggressor or a threat to the dog. Do not approach the food. That's a pretty common sense one. You guys deal with this in your compounds. You do your tests, see how they react to the different food or actions with the hand and whatnot going towards the food. Well, if I'm sitting down to a nice steak dinner and you try to put your fork over on my dinner, guess what? You could be walking away with my fork in the back of your hand because get out of my supper, it's mine. Okay. That's food aggression. It could be something that, depending on the type of dog, every dog is different when it comes around to these reactions. Uh, for instance, I'm, I have shepherds, so I can tell you, I used to get phone calls saying my dog hasn't eaten. I said, how long's it been? Two days. I said, don't worry about it, it's a German shepherd. They can go two, three days, not think anything of it, okay? They're, they aren't like us. They don't eat because it's the time of day and that's what you do. They, a lot of dogs will eat only because that's what they need to do. But having said that, if you see a dog that's not eating the food, don't think they aren't hungry. They still want it there. They could be resource storing, so they still don't want you to touch it. So when you walk in and pick up the bowl that had food in it, but because they didn't eat it, you better be very careful because maybe they wanted it for later on. It depends what they had before they got into your shelter, what, how they were treated. How often did they eat? Do not approach the pups. That's pretty, pretty common knowledge. Don't uh, go after the pups in there, have a touch them. Uh, don't run, don't run away. And you'll see this phrase, don't run, quite a few times here. We'll be repeating a lot of things as we go through this, okay? Uh, move an item, what happens is if you get in there, the dog is around, you don't know what's going on. Yes, move an item in front of you. Okay, that could be anything, a hat, clipboard. I never go up to a house without either having my hat, my clipboard, or a folder in my hand. I have something in my hand. I'm going to put it in front of me. If the dog uh, changes its stance to become less aggressive, it, uh, it stops advancing towards you. Ba uh, just back away slowly. Okay, back away slowly, keeping an eye on the dog the whole time. So you're going to back away slowly when they change their stance. Uh, keep your body facing the dog, but your head tilted slightly away. Don't maintain a stare. Again, staring right at the dog is a challenge, so you just have it off to one side. Don't run. I know everybody thinks that's funny, but when you look at that photo, don't run. You, the game is on. Okay. When you see that photo there, that's not unusual. The dog ran away, prey drive kicked in, you're now theirs. All right. So it's important that you, you, you don't run away. Okay, I'm going to take you through some photos now. And I'll just stand to one side. And these photos are going to show you some different situations that have arrived around here locally. These aren't from away. They aren't from some other country. They're local. Where's the bite? Back of the leg. It's in the back of the leg. The person was running away. It's the same with this one right here. Caught him on the, the back of the calves there. Okay, they're running away. They had no way of protecting themselves. The reason why I show you some of these photos is you should know what the potential is out there. Even though they're all nice dogs, it only takes one. That particular dog there, uh, it happened in HRM. There was an eight-year-old woman with her eight-year-old son living with her father. The girl, the woman, and the son went to church. The father wanted to mow the lawn before it started raining. This was a Sunday morning. He went to take the dog by the collar to put it in the big pen. It turned on him. He fought the dog for six minutes. If you don't think six minutes is a long time, ask anybody that's been on patrol or a policeman could you fight someone for six minutes? They'll say, no, two minutes, you're fried. Okay, he maintained control of this dog until he got him inside the pen. What happened in there is this shoulder is totally pulled out of joint. If I go back up one, you see the post right where it's tied? That's all covered with blood. This was raining this morning. 
All in the back of the dog there was a big pool of blood. It was washed off by the time we, uh, we got there. So there's the shoulder out of joint. He was taken right away. His brother heard him and came over. He had actually, uh, the father had put a, a pipe around the neck to secure the dog and got him into that pen. If he had gone to ground, he would have been killed. This is the gentleman at the Cobbaquid. Uh, at this point, he wasn't feeling any pain. That's what it's like when the dog wants to tear you apart. On the other hand, both arms now are permanently damaged for life with him. He didn't fight the dog and try to pull away from it. He stayed with the dog as he put it away. The next photo I'm going to show you is of a person that wanted to pull away from the dog. He wanted to fight. No, I'm trying to run. I'm trying to move. So the more you fight, the more you go in with the dog, the more it's going to tear and go away. And that's what it looks like. Not pretty. So that's the difference of you keeping your calm enough to think, what can I do? And, the, you know, this is, this is the sad part. This is, the next slide I'm going to show you is something that I like showing because these are the people that pay the price a lot of times. If we put a dog out there, number one, it has potential to do harm. Number two, that we knew had a bad history coming in. These little guys pay the price. Okay? He almost lost his eye. And he was just playing. That's all that happened. He wasn't doing anything to provoke the dog. The dog had no history. This next one, Oh, first of all, if that, the one with the father and the uh, daughter, when we got there, they located the daughter and she came home. And we explained, I explained to the person what had happened. And she had no concern whatsoever. She says, well, of course the dog did that. It senses, it senses fear. And that's all she could say. Meanwhile, her father's chewed up over in the emergency ward. This next one's going to come up is one that she was being babysat by a woman. It was coming up closer to Christmas time. She had a friend, uh, a man, who had a place where his daughter lived with him and his daughter's boyfriend. They lived in the basement part of the house. The dog was downstairs with them. The boyfriend, uh, first of all, they arrived. They were sitting in the living room because he had put up his Christmas tree. And he wanted to show this, <coughs> they wanted to show the little girl the Christmas tree. She went to the home. They were sitting on the couch. And suddenly a dog arrives. The boyfriend from downstairs, of course, in the duplexes, the bathrooms were upstairs. So he came up in the basement, but he left the basement door open. And this dog came out. This dog walked by in between the coffee table and the couch. This little person was sitting on the couch, and out of the clear blue sky, that's what happened. This was the first photo I saw of it. Okay? I know it's not easy to look at. That is very, very possible if you don't keep your senses, okay, behind you. It's really important that you understand. Sometimes it takes very little to hurt somebody. A fearful dog will come up with a little shallow bites. A dog that has full aggression will come in and take the full bite like the big boy I just showed you with the mother and or the daughter and the grandson. When I loaded that dog up, I had four units, RCMP units around me, all weapons on. I said if I fall, shoot. I don't care if it's me I'm not gonna make it out of it. Not with a dog that's that strong. The dog was put down. I weighed the dog because they were having problems picking it up. It was 136 pounds of pure muscle. And I'm going to tell you straight up. If you're less than the weight of the dog, you're going to be in trouble. If you're 100 pounds trying to deal with a 150 pound dog, use your smarts. Okay, so set yourself up in a situation where well, if something happens, I'm going to be in trouble. So at all times, should people know where you're at? In your own facilities, if you're out with a dog, make sure someone else knows you're out there. Make sure if 
a window there. Perfect. If there's not, see if maybe they can put one in or at least watch them. It's very, very important because what happens, for instance, if you're out and it's the winter time and you slip and the dog's coming at you, what are you going to do? Do the same thing as you would if it was a bear attack. Drop, tuck in. Curl up and tuck in. All right, that way they can always get to your back. At least sure, you're going to have bites possibly, but if the dog knows that you aren't going any further, they'll stop sooner. Get rid of your exposed area, cover it up. Okay, this next video, um, just some tips on it. It's going to go through a few different things. With the dogs, um, you can apply this to what you do in your everyday life at the compounds. already this dog will bite and this dog will make a commitment to hurt me and I'm gonna walk in the backyard and he's gonna be cut loose while I have nothing on except this coat and gloves on I'm gonna go back there and see what the dog does to me let's do just very quickly, this dog actually does bite. It is a biter. So it's not just staged for this. So you saw him back his way through, but you saw what happened to the hat. I can tell you that that hat works. I have officers, we have a new batch of officers uh, that have come through in the past year. I give them very similar uh, presentation. The hat thing worked. Two big Roddy's come after him. And he came back and says, yeah, it worked. They were, they were grabbing the hat. Okay, they will go with what's in front of you. So that's important, you remember that. I don't care what you use, and neither does anybody else. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it costs $1,000, and they, it, the first thing and the only thing that the, uh, your shelter could afford to buy at that kind of a price, use it. If it's there, use it. You have to use it. It's a matter of you getting out of there, okay? They are not putting a price on anything just because they want to keep it and you can get bit. They want to make sure you're, you're uh, you're safe, okay? So there's a couple of situations that I'll just go over briefly. And this is where you guys have to watch it, is when you have dogs out in the compound together, okay, you don't know when that other dog is talking to this dog over here. They use eye language. Be very careful that they don't do the stare down. And you'll go over this a little bit. I believe Amy has a, a presentation that's gonna go over some of these other things. So I won't go into that part here. But uh, 
If it's not silly to say you're afraid. It's not, definitely not. No one is macho enough, I don't know what the word would be with, with the females here, but don't be afraid. It's really, really important. None of us are that big and that brave that we can't be afraid of something. It, it happens. I can vote for it, I can tell you, on a personal level. It can happen, okay? And it does, <clears throat> it does change you. You start looking at things differently. But really, at the end of the day, we want you guys to have one piece. Any questions? Let's go to some questions. Must be a question. Hmm. Yes. If you're approaching a house that doesn't have like a screen door or secondary door, how would you secure the door that opens in? You can't. If they only have the one door, especially if it's an inward swing, uh, as most houses are, um, you can't. So because there's no door there, you're going to be on the alert. Because what happens, the first thing you open up that door, the dog comes flying out. So just be ready for a dog coming out. But it's a good point because not everybody has that screen door. So you should have been on guard the moment you stepped out of your vehicle. As soon as you stepped out of your vehicle, you were vulnerable because they could open up the door at that time before you even reach the front step. You know, what happens now in your shelters, an incident happens and now you've got a dog on top of a person over there. What are you going to do? Any ideas? Okay. First thing you're going to do is try to do it remotely. In other words, without touching anything. That could be the garden hose. I don't care if it's a piece of rope, what it is. You're going to crack the dog in the backside. You need something to break that focus on the dog. He had mentioned earlier in the, in the video about auditory exclusion. And that is what happens. You wonder why your dog is focused on something and it takes off and it won't come back. It doesn't hear you. It's focused that far ahead of you. Pet bulls, notorious pit bulls. Everybody says their jaw's locked. No, they're just stubborn. Okay, you need something to break the dog of that. So that's the first thing you're gonna do. But before you do that, you're gonna have to be prepared, be prepared to have something in your hand when the dog comes off. Don't approach the front end of the dog that's now attached to the person. It's just gonna come off and get you. Redirected aggression, it's if you go like this, tap it on the back. If it thinks you're coming in to do harm, you're going to get nailed too. A couple things that work, depending on the degree of the attack, is grab the back legs, lift them up. At least you've got control, they can't spin around on you. They're going to let go of the person that they're attached to. And that's going to buy you time. Now you've got to look, all right, I've got this buzzsaw at the end of these two <laughs> legs, these handles. What do I do now? Uh, people? Anybody? <laughs> uh, you know, can you help me? Okay. At that point, someone can go get a cat pole or something to get the dog and take over from you. You can't actually maneuver the wheelbarrow towards one side. It's not easy. But it's, it, that's something you have to be prepared. Not just to keep yourself uh, protected, but um, what happens if someone else gets in trouble? How can you help them? Anything else? So, any tips on use of catch pole or, you know, you have to corner a dog or, you know, it's better to tie it really tight first and things like that. Um, catch poles, that's a totally different thing. That uh, It's best done in the shelter, but the catch pole, when the biggest mistakes that are made on a catch pole is they get it and they've never used it before. Okay, so they have to get used to using that catch pole. Some of the dogs, you make a game out of it, you practice catching the dog with it. Oh, come on over here and uh, loosen it up. Make sure you know how to adjust the end of the catch pole. You have a release for the cable that lets the, uh, the noose go big and then pull it in for when it's in to tighten it up. Most mistakes are made because people are so afraid of hurting the dog they leave the noose too big. Okay, and what happens? The dog just backs his head out of it. Now he's ticked. Okay, tighten it up. Snug it up, believe me, you won't go too tight. You can always let a little bit out, but it's too late if the dog gets out. So know how to use your catch pole. Uh, don't be afraid to use a catch pole. Catch pole is just a stiff leash. So, can you use a catch pole when someone's being bit? Not until they let go. 
okay? If you irritate them, they will grab, and anybody that has a catch pole in their facility, you'll see teeth marks, because they whip around and they don't want it, okay? That could be your hand if you try to go in without something. So regards, we have nice big gloves that we use. They're, they're meant for taking a bite. It doesn't mean I don't get crushed, just means I can count all five fingers when it's done at the end of the day. It's my last resort to go hands on. Yes? Um, if, okay, so he's asking if a dog's uh, gotten a little too hyper, too aggressive. Not necessarily aggressive, but excited, is it? Anything? Okay. Um, you have to watch when they're escalating. Okay, try not to let the dog escalate to that level because, yeah, you're going to have your hands full. If you can't control it, you have your loopy, you have your different types of, of uh, leashes and that you have, you aren't going to be able to catch it. Now you have to corner it. They're saying, ha, 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 now I can't, you know, I can't, uh, you can't get me. You are, I would suggest if it gets to that point where it's that serious, put the catch pole, get the catch pole, and you are going to have to corner it. You have no choice. You have to corner the dog to get the catch pole on but that catch pole now becomes your defense item as well. Don't be afraid to use the catch pole if you have to. We're talking about dog bites in serious situations. That catch pole is your, your means to defend yourself should you have to. Okay, so just be aware of that. I can block with the catch pole, all right? I can maneuver the dog away and keep them from getting in at me. So I use that as more of a tool and an instrument as I do anything else. If you're using batons, that's baton is now let them bite it all they want. You know, matter of fact, I'd let him bite it. I'd, I'd prefer he takes all his tension right to that baton. For the catch poles, for it, you should have one close to a door so someone can get her if they have to. Going to your facility now, okay, make sure, number one, they know you're outside. Number two, they're checking on you. What do you have available to you out there? Different things, different times of year. You have a garden hose. Have a catch pole ready. So mount one close to the door. If they had to go searching for it, the dog's going to escalate in whatever's happening. Remember I said about that, that dog that has a, either a chemical imbalance or a trigger that you don't know what it is? Well, maybe you just found it by mistake. Whoa, that happened. We don't know what it is, but the dog flipped. So be prepared for that and have stuff close enough to use. Anything else? Yep. Um, when we're getting dogs out of their kennels, it's common for there to be a lot of other dogs who start barking and everyone is very excited. So then you're trying to open the door and get the leash on the collar. You know, this is a dog most of the time we've ever met. Mm -hmm. So even if they're calm dogs, it just seems like a bit of a recipe for disaster trying to open the door a little bit, get your hand in, usually their face is right, you know, right it, there. So it, is there... Yeah, so you still have to control the door. Okay, it's important you control the door at all times. So you leave your foot down there. You have limited space for the dog to get out and your body's there blocking. Okay, so it depends on what kind of leash. I'm not going to use one with a clip if I'm getting the dog out. You can if the dog's wearing it and you can, get, you can access where the little D-ring is. It's fine. Clip it, but a lot of times you guys take the, the collars off the animals when they're inside the pens for their own safety. So you may not even have one. Maybe you're trying to put that on at the same time. I would use, um, for instance, a, there's a kennel lead, just a loop. You can pop that and take the dog out with that. You just slip it over and just snug it up a little tight and walk out with it that way. If they have the collar, great, you can, you can slip on. But block the door with your foot, make sure it can't go any further because they're getting excited. You're absolutely right. And you're going to be the block here. So you should know something about the dog. This brings up another thing. If you're going to take a dog out, ask the other people in the pound, in the shelter. Are there any, is there anything I should know about any dogs here? Do they get excited and nip because they're excited? You know, I should know that before I open up the door to take the dog out. Whoops, it's a nipper. I didn't know that. And you thought it was, it was going into something more serious. And then it escalates by mistake. So it's really important you ask questions. But yeah, definitely you control the door. You have to control the door. Because if it bounces on that and knocks you over, it's just running over top of you to go play with the dogs. That head is going to be almost outside of the door. Yeah. It's going to try to get out. If the door is coming up right here, I've blocked it with my body and with my foot. The head is trying to nose out. The head is right here. Almost the nose is passing into the door. 
got guaranteed. You know, if they want to get out, unless you get the shy ones in back. So that's where you're clipping it on right there. The hand doesn't probably have to go in further, any further than that. Okay, it makes it easy that way. The shy dog, that's a different story. But if you have a dog that's that rambunctious to get out for whatever reason, you know, you're holding them there until you can clip on. And that's it. You're, you're dealing with dogs that um, you don't know the history. So it, it, that brings the importance of asking about the dogs because it could be a dog that's just happy to be there. Loves life, is a really gentle dog. But know it before you go in, because you know, now I can do this with the dog. Or the other one's, ah, it's a little touchy if you go to grab its collar. Okay, know those little things first. That will be, you'll know that before the dog ever gets to the point where it's going out with you. Either your officers have brought a dog in so they can give you a, an update as, oh, it doesn't like being handled, because they're a little stressed to start with if they're um, caught and taken in by animal services or animal control or your officers. Uh, if they're turned in by somebody, they're upset too. My whole life just walked out the door. Now I'm sitting in here and I don't know what to do. And they get into a real depression state. Sometimes they'll flip back out of depression and just don't go near me, I'm waiting for my master to come back. But just watch the dogs and that's what your, the other people on your shelter are there for. You have people trained to, to observe this and watch it. So it's really important that communication in the, uh, in the shelter takes place. If I could just comment on that, that's why it's really important to pay attention to your behavioral sheets. Um, and then we're looking at, of course, we've got in place now green, yellow, and red dogs. That's why it's really critical to pay attention to all that. And if you're having a lot of trouble actually taking a dog out of the kennel, you should probably speak to like a staff person or some or one of the other persons that have you know done the temp testing or something like that. If you're at all concerned, close the door. Don't take that dog out. It's not a matter of necessity to get the dog out of there. It's never a necessity. Okay, so it's they're safe in there and everybody else is safe. But when I said ask about communication, that's already taken place in the background. So use your resources that you already have there. And if you're using behavioral sheets, it's all the better. It's perfect. Have a look at it and believe what it says. And don't, no, 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 no. Don't become the dog whisperer. It's only good on TV, all right? I will say just, and add that to the behavior, behavioral sheet. You know, if you're noticing this, you know, either add it to the behavior sheet or tell somebody to add it to the, beha the behavior sheet if you're noticing this consistent behavior because it's very important that everybody knows that as well. The key to this whole thing is communication, okay? Whether it be after something happens or just in your everyday work at the shelters. Communication is vital. You may have seen something that the others didn't. A fresh set of eyes sometimes can see something different. The dog changed for some reason from when it was last taken out. So yeah, pass that stuff along. But you have a good crew, they have a good system set up, but it's only as good as what you make it. In other words, all the information you can provide, make sure it gets passed on, and you read the information that's been passed down before you attend it. So that was a good, a good point. Anything else? Quiet punch. This is Hector Hernandez from First Class Dog Training. I hope by viewing these videos, you'll know how to protect yourself from a dog attack. Or at the very least, know what to do if you encounter a dog. If you have a dog that keeps coming at you, you're undecided whether he's going to bite you or not, and you don't have pepper spray, a good thing to utilize is your hat. You got a dog coming at you, straight at you, just put the hat in front of you and move it. You gotta make sure you, you do a moving target. If he bites your hat, now you know the dog's intent, now you can escalate your use of force by giving strikes, or if you're a police officer, use of force, anything like that. But make sure you put something in front of the dog and you move it. We already know this dog is committed to bite. I'm gonna be walking, and if the dog does come after me, I'm gonna have my hat and he bites the hat, and he goes back. We know that a dog is committed to bite. You put something in front of him that's moving, he's going to target on that and not on the individual. 
And again, we can do it again just so you see. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. He's coming. Put something in front of him. He bites it and come back. Now, my options are, after I know the dog is committed to bite, my options are to use my strikes, pepper spray, and if I'm a police officer, I could use lethal force. But at least I know the dog is committed to bite. Some dogs will run and stop, and you're not going to know whether they're committed to bite or not. That's why it's nice to put something in front of them. Once they are committed, then you can escalate your use of force at that time. One, never run from a dog. Two, don't turn your back at any dog. Three, don't trust the owner. Average owner is not going to know what their dog is doing or what their dog is telling them. The fourth is don't assume dogs are friendly. Don't know the dog, just assume that they're a stranger. And the fifth one is don't stand face to face in a threat. You have to move, you have to react. There's two myths I want to talk about. One, don't stare a dog in the eyes. People, you have to know where your threat is at all times. You do not want to project to this dog that you're weak. By looking away, you're projecting that you're weak. You have to face the dog, walk backwards, get out of there. Keep an eye on the dog at all times. The second myth is the dog's tail is wagging. All that means is the dog is happy. And could he be happy to bite you? Absolutely. Some dogs are going to be very happy to want to bite you. So that's just a myth. Realize that. Uh, your main line of defense is going to be reading your dog's body language. What do I mean by that? You have to know what your dog is telling you or what the dog is telling you at any given time. Friendly dog. What's a friendly dog going to do? Universal with every breed. It doesn't matter which dog it is. If the full body is moving, the full body is moving, mouth open and closed and relaxed, you know the dog is friendly. The full body has to be moving, mouth open, relaxed, friendly potentially threatening or threatening. Dog's mouth is going to be closed. It's going to be looking away from you. Or it's not going to want to look at you. But it's not going to want to run away. It's going to stay there, look away, and then as you get closer, they go in for a bite. The third one is a dangerous dog. That one's pretty easy. People direct eye contact that becomes tunnel vision. Owner could be yelling at the dog. The dog's going to be intent on looking at you. The dog's going to have auditory exclusion. Not even going to hear anything going to have the tunnel vision direct to you. Most of the time, the mouth's going to be tense, and it's going to be coming straight at you. The body, full body, is not going to be moving. At times, the hackles are going to be coming up. That's just because the dog is a little insecure. He's trying to make himself look bigger, but he can still be a dangerous dog at that time. The whole time the dog is approaching you and coming at you, he's assessing your own body language. He's assessing if you're afraid. He's assessing if you're weak. He's assessing if you're injured, if you're old. You have to project to yourself that you are confident and you're leaving out of there with confidence. We're going to approach a potentially threatening dog. You can see the dog's mouth tighten up. Body, mouth tense, body tight. Notice his mouth open as I approach, his mouth tenses up. I wanted to show you with a dangerous dog how to approach it, how not to approach it. You notice if I walked up to the dog, it was very aggressive. If I walked backwards facing the dog, it didn't lunge. If I turned and run, it started to lunge and bite me. It's very important that you look at your threat and you walk backwards. As soon as you turn away and run, the dog's going to lunge and bite. When utilizing an impact weapon, you want to make sure you strike the dog right on the spine or in the middle of the shoulders. Right on the spine or the middle of the shoulders. If you're using your hands to strike the dog or your feet, you have several options. One, if the dog's fighting you, you want to hit under the throat as hard as you can. Under the throat, uppercut. Next one is going to be in the middle of the shoulders. Right in the middle of the shoulders as hard as you can. And if you're, if you're able, right over the spine as hard as you can. Try to avoid hitting the head. If you hit a dog in the head, all you're going to do is make them bite down harder and initiate a fight. 
You want to create this impact weapon. You want to be able to hit this dog hard enough to let him know that you are not weak. Uh, another option is going to be to, to kick the dog. Your leg is much longer than your arm. So you're able to kick the, kick the dog right in the chest. But you're dead. What I like to do is get the dog's attention to look up high and then kick in the chest as hard as you can. This is a fight for your life for some of these dogs. You have to kick extremely hard. It's a common question that I get asked and homeowners and police and anybody in uniform should be aware of. Homeowners, you should be aware that there is dogs who do not want to do it. And the reason for that is, is because people in uniform will come and go in your property. Your dog's at home doing his job by barking at anybody who comes near his territory. He barks and barks or she barks and barks continuously and the person in a uniform, whether it be letter carrier or officer or utility worker, walks away. In the process of walking away, you're also telling the dog that it's one being counted. The more and more this happens, the more and more the dog barks and scares away the person in uniform, the more confident this dog gets with uniforms. The problem arises when the dog is outside loose and sees somebody in uniform and knows that it's got the confidence to chase this person away. It charges after that individual, and now that leaves that person in uniform more vulnerable. So that's why they don't like people in uniform. So homeowners, just because they like everybody else, they could single out just the people in uniform. People in uniform understand that dogs see you as somebody that they can win against, whether it be through aggression or territory. So just be aware of that. A little more cautious when you're in uniform. When using pepper spray, you want to use your weak hand. Try not to use your strong hand. You may need to use that for some strikes or trying to get out of something. Use your weak hand. Face your threat. Make sure you extend your arm with your um, strong hand. You want to put that in front of your face in case there's backlash or wind coming at you. Go ahead and spray straight and let go. Now make sure the dog keeps coming at you that you keep spraying. And then there's other options to utilize if the dog is imminent on attacking you. Pepper spray. The only type of dog this is the only type of dog this is going to work on are dogs who are undecided whether they're going to bite you or not. If they really want to bite you, you might as well just throw this away. This is only going to make them very upset and want to bite you harder. So be aware this is just an option to use. This is going to be how I want you to approach a house when there's dogs at the door. I want you to tell the owner what to do. Don't ask them. Tell them what to do so you've got control of the situation. Also, I need you to take control of the door to make sure that the dogs don't change their mind halfway into the encounter. When approaching the house, I want to be able to take control of the door, maybe not resist it, but just hold it in case the dogs become aggressive and allow the owner to open it. Hello. Hi. Can you control your dogs or, or uh, put them away? Yeah. Well, I, I think, hold on. I can control a couple of them. <laughs> so if you think the dog's at any time out of control, you have the responsibility for your safety. So you can tell them to take control of the dogs or put the dogs away. Okay. Just a couple things I'm going to comment about on the, on the video. It said kick the dog. When do you do that? The only time I would say you ever do that is if the dog is already on your arm and you're trying to get him off. Anytime outside of that, I hear this all kinds of times with the letter carriers because I do them as well. If you kick the dog or go to kick the dog and it grabs your foot or your boot or shoe, whatever, guess where that leaves you? Hopping around on one foot. You aren't going anywhere. Then you're your game for the dog, okay? Because then you're going to go to ground. Okay, so that's that's that uh, is important there. Pepper spray. I've had all kinds of people comment different comments on pepper spray, different types of pepper spray that have been all over from everywhere from 
Yukon to Germany to uh, UK to the States to everywhere. They've tried just about every solution going. It only works on the mild dogs. A dog that is that determined to get to you will go right through it. And it only buys you a little bit of time. So I don't recommend pepper spray. And not only that, but if you spray it into the wind, you got spray all over you. One of the things that uh, I think I've I've already passed the comment on here earlier was the little air horns. Now it's not a total 100% cure thing that's going to prevent things from happening, but with the little air horns, you can pick them up Canadian Tire, a different place like that. But what happens is when you press the air horn, it'll startle the dog. It could buy you that one or two seconds you need to back up to that gate. But it also tells other people when they hear that sound, something's wrong. And they're going to be out looking for you. Uh, controlling the door. How do you apply controlling a door to your situation in a shelter? When before you open up that door, the dog's rambunctious, make sure you have control of the door. Foot down on the bottom part so they don't bounce on it. It comes flying out and flying open on you. Control that door. How else can we do that? Outside in your compound. Okay, before you go out, the dogs are trying to get in, the dog's loose, it's not on a lead, or maybe someone dropped a lead by mistake. It happens, the dogs can pull themselves away from you and they're loose out there. Control the door, okay? You're no good to anybody else if you're injured. So you take care of yourself first so you can take care of them. If you go in and you're injured, you're no longer any good to somebody else. Pay attention to who's outside with dogs. Pay attention to where they are and how long they've been out there. It's really, really important that you do that because they could be looking for help and it's up to you to supply that help. Okay, don't think of yourself as a singular unit. Think of yourself as a group, a team, and you look after each other. Make sure you're aware of the other person, where they're at, all the times. The small dogs, does size matter? No. Nah. It hurts just as much when they bite you. It's just not as big a bite. But your bit, okay? Um, there was something on the first part of the, the uh, presentation, deaths due to dog. I can tell you that it's not necessarily the big dogs that do that killing. I can um, tell you from experience that a small dog can kill a person. How do they do that, you say? Person gets bit, they get blood poisoning. This person, the senior, died because of blood poisoning. So we the death to that dog. So when you get bit, don't treat it as some mild thing either. Tell someone else, look, the dog just bit me. Don't be afraid. Okay, it's not an embarrassing thing. It happens. Driving a car, the more you drive a car, the higher the odds that something's going to happen. You're going to have an accident someday. The more you handle dogs, the higher the chances are that you're going to get bit someday. Okay, maybe not seriously, maybe a little, little nip. Maybe your reactions were a little quicker than the other person and, and already got a little nip in. Okay, you're there to protect not just the dogs, but yourselves. That's how you can help those dogs, is don't put them in a situation where it totally traumatized them to the point where you can't rehome them now or even keep them with the other people.